I'm going to be honest. Dragon's Dogma is so niche, I barely care about it. And the only reason that a lot of people seem to care about it at the moment was the discourse over it and how loud Dragon's Dogma fans are. And I can say the same thing about Elden Ring. And we saw it with Elden Ring. I'm a huge FromSoft fan. I love their games. But Elden Ring had a very hilarious little trajectory when it launched, uh, at least online, of people going, Oh man, Elden Ring looks so cool. I'm so hyped. My friends are excited for it. They said it's really challenging. And yeah, I like challenges. The amount of people I saw getting just bounced off of from that game due to the FromSoft design and the FromSoft difficulty and the lack of handholding and the demands that it does ask of a player. It's why we had that whole discourse of should we have a difficulty slider? Are games like this not accessible enough for people? Okay, anyway, I don't know if we're going to watch this whole video, but the article for this was interesting. And yes, Fortnite is in not an old game, but it is not a recent game at this point. Fortnite is Fortnite seven years old. Like, it's not new, new, new. Just 66 titles saw 80% of the playtime in 2023. Most of them being old, quotation mark, games like Fortnite or Grand Theft Auto V. <laughs> well, I mean... By the definition, yes, that is true. See, I've been seeing this um, statement being bandied around a little bit as if it is an indication that the good old days were simply so much better than they are today. But the good old days, well, in this case, the good old days are still pretty much the bad current year days, in my opinion. And the whole thing- Games have always sucked on release. Breaking as well. We had reports from 2022 as well, basically- AAA games are the ones that's gotten worse. And it turns out that a game literally designed to be played forever, Fortnite is being played forever. I know. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking about this earlier because I, I watched, I think I said at the start of stream, but I did catch the first like three minutes of this video from an Asmund reacts and then I stopped because I wanted to watch it on my stream. But The video isn't explicitly about this. I still want to mention it, though. I don't like the argument of the good old days because games have always had rocky releases. And yes, I think it has gotten inarguably worse when it comes to more higher profile games. Not necessarily AAA only, but definitely the closer you skew to AAA, the more the release of a game is kind of lorded over internally, it feels like, with the, oh, we could just patch it after it comes out. We we'll just leave that in. We could just patch that. Instead of what it probably used to be, which was, this is a big, important game we need to make sure it's not a dumpster fire because we can't easily patch it. We can silently release a version 1.2, 1.3, all on Nintendo with Twilight Princess or Skyward Sword, which had game breaking bugs where your save could be corrupted to the point of, oh, you're, you know, 70 hours into the game and now it's in it's unplayable you literally can't progress or go back you you've like hard locked into a room and nintendo had that happen on both of those games and the solution was to either put your save on an sd card send it off to nintendo or literally mail your entire wii to nintendo and get your get your device back with the patch implemented granted they then sent out a newer version of the game to stores for future customers that did not have the bug, but they couldn't patch it. I mean, I believe it was Skyward Sword that got a, an update channel specifically on the Wii so that they could patch the game because patching still wasn't a thing really back then. It was just becoming a thing finally. And Nintendo didn't have anything built in like Sony did or Xbox did. Sony and Microsoft, my bad. Mailing the whole as a Wii. <laughs> I'm glad I missed that bug. For people who don't know, I can't remember what the Skyward Sword one was. I believe it was a dungeon you could get soft locked into with a key. 
on Twilight Princess, it was specifically if you did the quest chain where I'm calling it a quest chain, Jesus Christ. If you did the portion of the game where you have to get the bridge back to Hyrule Field right after I forget what which, which dungeon was it the forest dungeon? I can't remember which dungeon it was, but you get the bridge back. Midna places the bridge back down. If you cross the bridge and then immediately close the game, essentially what happens is the game saves Link's last position as that side of the bridge, but the bridge wasn't saved as being returned yet. So you'll actually load into the game on the other side and the bridge is now missing. And since you can't get back any other way, you're stuck on that side of the bridge and you can't progress any storyline because there's no storyline to progress on that side. Now that the save has reverted back to before the bridge was even set. So the flag needed to progress the story in the first place was never even set. Essentially anyway. And the solution was to mail your whole Wii back to Nintendo. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> but what I think is more important and interesting to point out about this entire survey here, which basically suggests that most of the games played are simply quite old. On PC, 9.6 years. On PlayStation, 7.4. Xbox, 7.2. With only the Nintendo Switch having a 3.9. Now, a four-year period is hardly a blink of an eye, but... You know what? I'm not going to rant about Nintendo. We've rant about, ranted about Nintendo constantly. I'll be positive about Nintendo for once on my stream. <laughs> Nintendo just makes good games still. I'm not a fan of Mario Odyssey. I'm not a fan of the direction Zelda's going in. But they still have super, super good games. To the point of, yes, you can go back and play them. But the majority of players at the time are going to focus on the current game because each subsequent entry is solid from Nintendo. They're always solid. Odyssey, it would be it would be asinine of me to go, Tears of the Kingdom isn't a solid Zelda game or Mario Odyssey isn't a solid Mario. No, they're fucking great. They're very solid. I just don't like them. Wow, good old Nintendo. Hi, Storm. Welcome in, man. How do you get my cracker spam and cheese? Lose the spam and, and I'll agree. <laughs> It'd be cool if they give you a Zelda skin for your Wii, like a nice surprise. That'd be fun. Like it'd be like having to go out of your way for that. If they would have given you something else back, that would have been nice. But it's modern Nintendo, yes. I would be I would be very much on the side of, yeah, where's my where's my con like little compensation thing? What the what the hell? I just lost my console for two weeks because of you guys. Nintendo back when the Wii and the Wii U were a thing, that era of Nintendo was sometimes it weirdly rocky. Very little, and it seems <laughs> like it's not worth it. And you wonder why you waited so long for That's something so disappointing. But like it the video is gonna probably touch on this. I have a feeling, but If the average years on the market for the top 10 games on like PC is almost a decade and almost, well, I almost said almost eight. If we're rounding up, it's not even that. If we're rounding down. If it's seven years old for Sony and for Microsoft's communities, like it's, I think all that does is speak to the lack of not only innovation, but Interesting stories on newer games. Like, who cares? Who cares about going to play a game like Forspoken that just came out that was like super shiny and had a lot of marketing behind it? Who cares about, uh, like, yeah, I'm going to be honest. Dragon's Dogma is so niche, I barely care about it. And the only reason that a lot of people seem to care about it at the moment was the discourse over it and how loud Dragon's Dogma fans are. And I can say the same thing about Elden Ring. And we saw it with Elden Ring. We saw it the same. Like I, I'm a huge FromSoft fan. I love their games. But Elden Ring had a very hilarious little trajectory when it launched, uh, at least online. 
of people going, oh man, Elder Ring looks so cool. I'm so hyped. My friends are excited for it. They said it's really challenging. And yeah, I like challenges. The amount of people I saw getting just bounced off of from that game due to the FromSoft design and the FromSoft difficulty and the lack of handholding and the demands that it does ask of a player. It's why we had that whole discourse of should we have a difficulty slider? Are games like this not accessible enough for people? Why go check out something that you're you're not confident you're going to like if it doesn't do anything that genuinely interests you? Because I maybe this is naive, but I'm going to wager not not a <sighs> what's the word I want? Um Shoot, my mind's blanking. What is the word for... <laughs> an amount of something that... De- negligible. A non-negligible amount of those people that went, Elden Ring looks so good. Didn't even care. Insignificant? Okay, there, that's a better word. A not insignificant amount of those people that were going, Man, Elden Ring looks so cool. Didn't care about the lore. They didn't care about the world. They didn't care about the intrigue that the architecture in that world brings. They only cared because they saw hype behind it and they saw that their friends like it and were hyping it up as the biggest Souls type game. And going, nah man, this is the one you gotta get into. This is the Souls game. This is gonna be the one. This is the peak one. The other ones, I know, I get you didn't like them, but this one's going to be different. It's open world now. So they probably got excited over that. And then they bounced off the game as hard as possible because why wouldn't they? It's literally Dark Souls. If you don't like Dark Souls, you're not going to like Elden Ring. If we're talking strictly from an accessibility perspective and, and the demands that the game asks anyway. There's an argument to be made, of course, for the open world provides a different experience. So therefore someone might like it over dark souls because of the open world experience. But if we're talking about what was the inciting incident for all of the conversations that led to, we need a difficulty slider. These games are too hard. Not true. I started with Elden Ring, but hated souls games originally. Why did you like Elden Ring versus souls though? Because I, I just responded to to your case, but I want to see if I responded to why your experience is this. It seemed more accessible. But why, though? Is it because it's open world and there's less of a demand to go down a path that is difficult when you have more options to just like walk around things? Is that how it's more accessible? Because this is actually really interesting. If that If that's why, I'm curious. Yeah, I think so. Okay, that's interesting to me because I disagree entirely with that. I think from a not so narrow and unavoidable. That's weird. I need to play Elden Ring again just to confirm that I'm not gaslighting myself into believing that I'm correct in this thinking. I don't think the the games are different in that regard. I think from I think Elden Ring and Dark Souls 1, 2 and, and 3 so far are all just as open when it comes to the option you have in regards to fighting things, at least on a large scale. If you find the catacombs too hard, you don't have to go there. You can go to New Londo. And I'm going to tell you now, as a Souls player for a long time, you're going to find New Londo to be way too hard at the start because you literally cannot damage things down there without an item. If you find New Londo too hard, you can go to Undead Bird. If you find Undead Bird too difficult, you can probably sprint past it because it is, you know, the the default area for you. And you can make your way over to um either either Darkroot Garden or you could find your way. Shit, what's the other path you can take? What's through Undead Berg after you go up and fight the the giant Minotaur thing? There's two paths you can take there. But those are also options you have. 
One is actually hard progress. The other is an optional path you can go down first. The other route you could take is all the way through the back of New Londo. I believe you can get there early and you can go through to Blight Town. So you could go there. And in Elden Ring, your options are essentially the same thing. The perceived freedom, I think, is larger because the world lets you meander around a field and not corridors, but the options are still limited. You have Kaled, you have the path to the city, you have the path to the underground area, and I. what else is in, in uh, Elden Ring? What are the other main paths you can take? What was it? There was another path in Elden Ring. I haven't played Elden Ring enough to like talk about it in detail. Apologies. I mean, it could be a perspective thing since I do actually like Souls games as a whole now and enjoy them thoroughly. I think it's a perspective thing. And people see the open world as more inviting because people... Here's what's annoying. And this goes beyond games. I feel like people like to demand independence and demand agency from expectations that they have self-imposed. And where I'm going with that is when you play Dark Souls, if this is the case, you see that corridor and you see there's a tough enemy down it. And if you think that that's the only path, you feel like your independence and agency have been taken from you. And then that's a bad experience. If you're playing Elden Ring though, you see a big tough enemy and you just go, I can just walk around them. Well, you can walk around them in every Please other FromSoft give game. Me dopamine. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of that. But in, in, in Dark Souls, you can also just walk around them. But walking around them means you're going back up the corridor, finding another corridor or another route to go. And that takes some um, just initiative. And a lot of people don't want to show the initiative. And this is getting back into the, the longer games like conversation we had last week where someone was complaining or not someone but many people have complained uh, fast travel needs to be in the game i don't have time to play the game this long i have a family i have this i set myself up in this scenario where i don't have time to do my extracurricular activities anymore because i decided to th live this kind of life and this kind of life demands sacrifices and i don't want to make that kind of sacrifice okay but that's not the game's problem Forgot to mention that I used to not have patience for them. As I have gotten older, I enjoy them quite a lot more as the satisfaction of accomplishment. Uh, 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 and as the satisfaction of accomplishment is intense. Man, I don't know why Shad doesn't like Dark Souls. I really don't. We're yapping a jack at it. Hi, Geekling. Welcome in. How Dark Souls took my wife and kids away. So you're an American that has never eaten burgers. You are different. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's fair. I've never had onions. <laughs> I've never had onions either. But no, that's interesting that Elden Ring seems more accessible than Dark Souls does. Because that's literally impossible. Bru don't underestimate my foodism. Don't underestimate it. I haven't. There are foods I've never had that would drive you insane. What do you mean that's literally impossible? Cell so stay on top. <laughs> Look, the last video we watched on a stream that was 10 minutes, it took us an hour to get through it. <laughs> that's interesting though, Storm. Well, whenever we go through the other Souls games, I might bring that back up. That's cool. I do like the perceived accessibility of Elden Ring compared to Souls. When I think Elden Ring is just as inaccessible. But I think it's inaccessible because I've played the Elder Souls games first. The average development time of video games, a four-year period of domination by certain titles, makes a lot of sense, really. And you also got Zelda, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, Super Mario Bros. Wonders, Mario Kart 8. Like, these aren't, you know, Fortnite-style games. Or Grand Theft Auto, which has also kind of become a Fortnite-style game. Or Minecraft, you know? 
though there aren't a whole lot of strictly speaking single player games on the list. Um, Starfield. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how the hell Starfield got on this list at all, honestly. There's gotta be a lot of very weird people out there, that's all I can really say, in Hogwarts Legacy. I think, if anything, Starfield slipped onto this list right as it was being quantified, and then right after the list finished, it must have immediately nosed up. Can't wait for Flim Take Cell to eat stream. <laughs> I want to know how Flim is saying that's literally impossible that I've never had an onion. I've had Funyuns. Does that count? Back when I was younger, like when I used to eat, when I used to, I don't like them anymore. When I used to eat beans, uh, I forget what kind. Like if I saw onions in, in the beans, I would take the the onions out. And if I saw too many, I go, I'm not eating these now. <laughs> What's a funyun? Oh, my sweet summer child. Funyuns are so good. Funyuns are so good. So Funyuns are a, a, like a type of chip from everybody's favorite disgusting company, Frito-Lay. And Windows is not like me t letting me take a screenshot. Everybody strap in. We might just lose Windows Explorer. Okay, never mind. We're good. These are Funyuns, though. Funyuns are meh. Take it back. Funyuns are so good. I love Funyuns. Oh my god, they're so good. Do onions taste like Funyuns? Lay's the most mid-chip ever. They're not that bad. I'd rather have the real thing. Have you had a Funyun? Well, I assume you have because you said that. <laughs> like, what do they taste like? What's a real onion taste like compared to a Funyun? With way less salt? Yes. So I just need to salt the onion. I used to eat them and they cut my mouth. Well, that's part of the experience. <laughs> it means like an onion. <laughs> Laser glass? No, they're not. What kind of... La How are you eating chips? Are you like holding them vertically and... The most important takeaways from this thing is two. One, it completely and utterly disproves the Warner Bros. statement we saw a few weeks ago that, oh, the video game industry is crashing because it's just so darn unreliable. We just can't tell what's going to be popular. It's so volatile. You understand? No, not at all. The video game industry is not particularly volatile in the slightest. In fact, its primary problem appears to be that it's in fathomably sedentary. That Warner Brothers statement felt like the. Okay, I just make sure. I'm pretty sure that Warner Brothers statement is the statement they made in response to Suicide Squad Kill the Joker. What? Not Kill the Joker. What? Was it? What was the game? The really shitty one that came out recently. I put him in horizontally. A piece pops off and stabs me. How? I mean, I've had it. I've had it happen sometimes. I just think lays are a bit too salty. Oh, okay, so it was kill the Ju kill the Justice League. That's what it was. Um. No, I feel like that statement of it's too hard to predict the industry, it's very volatile, is just to appease investors to basically tell them it's not our fault, it's the industry's fault. But okay, all right. Just like it's... We're in the middle of the video, so I'm not going to segue into it right now. We're going to talk about Dead Space in a minute because I'm... like e Fuck EA. I, EA is such a shitty company. We'll get to that later. Again, Fortnite is hardly a spring chicken at this point, and it itself was basically just a last-minute deviation to try and get on the, um... What was that game called? The, um, the shooter game that started all of this survival shootery thing, the, um... H1Z1! My interest in this particular genre is zero. All y'all saying, Pupka, you, you weren't there. 
Daisy? Nope. Wasn't Daisy. H1Z1 started the, the Battle Royale mode. Like, insanity. Anywho. Daisy's not real. I don't care if I'm wrong. I'm going to die on my hill that H1Z1 was screwed over and was a brilliant game. I'm so mad that game got railroaded into the ground. H1Z1 was so much fun. <laughs> You're saying that like it's a niche opinion. Who? <laughs> wait, wait, are you the, the fuck EA thing? EA made loot boxes and microtransactions that plug games ever since. Actually... Uh, if you guys want to, if you guys want to point the finger at who made loot boxes and microtransactions, y'all got to talk to our our Lord and Savior Gabe Newell over at Valve for making Dota 2's loot boxes or uh, battle pass because Dota had the very first battle pass, <laughs> so you could actually blame Valve for a lot of the bullshit we have. <laughs> Okay, the facetiousness aside, yes, Valve did create the first battle pass, and Valve did essentially create loot boxes with the Counter-Strike keys and everything. And we can look at TF2 and a lot of the other stuff they did that were like precursors to the, the, the case and key formula. However, I think there is a... You can probably point to someone after Valve that was the person that exploited it. because. I don't, Valve is still probably the best example of the minimal exploitation style of loot boxes, in my opinion. But they are the most egregious about it when it comes to cosmetics. Valve thought it was cool and everyone thought it was a moneymaker. That's a really good way to put it. That's actually a really good way to put it. Like, Valve is a for-profit company, so there's part of it that was definitely... Because someone's going to be pedantic. Someone on this VOD or somewhere is going to be in my fucking comments. I've been getting more and more of these lately every now and then. Of, well, you didn't mention the obvious thing. Media literacy is hard. I get it. It's a big word. There's many syllables there, and it's two words, in fact, not just one. But... Valve is a for-profit company. You didn't mention that certain thing. <laughs> if you've got them, farm them. I do. I talk about them like this. I don't want to give people attention. So every now and then when I do pull one up, it's because I genuinely want to have a conversation. Or if it's something I do want to trash on, I'm just going to hide the name because fuck you. You don't deserve the uh, attention of the platform that I'm I'm on. Like, nah. <laughs> I'll talk about you and I'll laugh at you, but I'm not, I'm not going to show your name. Your opinion bad, change it. I saw that. <laughs> I did see that, Flem. That was very funny. <laughs> and Minecraft, which is older still. Like, Minecraft was a topic when I was in school, goddammit. Like, clearly here. Yeah. This isn't particularly well. The Sims, goddamn you. The Sims is a franchise is ancient. Yeah, The Sims is because just a Legends, nightmare now. God help me. I... Actually, no, uh, the video game industry is not very volatile. It's, it's rather sedentary. And what becomes hits is actually fairly easy to predict because the majority of the market right now are casuals. The most, and here's the problem though. Remember Sims Mobile? The casuals are also no. creatures of habit. <laughs> this makes it very difficult for new contenders to get into this field. It is very difficult for an outside company to try and create Fortnite because, well, Fortnite already exists. And thus, nobody is going to switch over from Fortnite to your alternative unless your alternative is absolutely mind-blowingly amazing. There's a quote from... I believe good old Cliffy B. Blazinski, who everybody loves to hate now, from, I want to say 2016, 2017, back whenever they were trying to release, what was that game? Um, Overwatch competitors. What was that game? Um, it was canceled. Battleborn. Man, Battleborn was so much fun. Battleborn got such a bad rap. For people that don't remember Battleborn, uh, don't blame you. <laughs> I do not blame you. 
Rip Battleborn. I played Battleborn's beta. I was there, god damn it. I was there the night that it ended. I was there the day it began. But Battleborn was a game. I know 2K published it. Who was the developer? It wasn't Gearbox, right? Oh, it was Gearbox. Okay. So Battleborn was Gearbox's like first attempt at making it an Overwatch killer. There was another one that came afterwards. Uh, Cliffy B. Uh, Hero Shooters. What was the other game? He had another game. Lawbreakers. Thank you, Flem. Put in chat like right after I found. <laughs> I'm searching in the background furiously. Anyway, Cliffy B said something a, a couple years ago. About Battle Royale in particular, and I don't think it applies to every part of the market, but it does apply to Battle Royale. And I think it applies to Battle Royale because it is very easy to get into as a casual player. His comment, I believe, if I can find it, I'll pull up the whole quote. Uh, bu -bu 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 it was something along the lines of there are only room for, I think, two big games and a third. So at the time, that was, I, what was it? It was Overwatch and what was the other hero shooter? There, there was another one that was really big at the time. I don't think it was Valorant. Or was it Valorant? Was Valorant picking up steam at that point? It was Overwatch and then one other and then there was a third. And I believe in that same statement, Cliffy B mentioned he wanted to become the third. He didn't want to become the second or first. He wanted to try and make, I believe it was, maybe it was Siege. It may have been at that time. He, it, But he wanted Battleborn to become the third, I believe. It may be Lawbreakers. This was so long ago that it's blending together. If I can find it, I'll put it in the Discord for you guys. But it was an interesting statement because he's not wrong if you look at the distribution of like popular shooters and popular mass market appealing Battle Royale games. Uh, it, it, like the, the big Battle Royale game for a while was uh, games. Player Unknowns Battlegrounds, Fortnite. Player Unknowns is going away. Warzone, Fortnite. Player Unknowns is now number three. It's not number two anymore. Fortnite is one. It was PUBG. Then in Warzone. And then Warzone and PUBG swap places. And now I don't know what Player Unknowns is doing. I don't know if anybody even plays it. It's got a healthy player base from my understanding. I don't know anybody that plays it though, personally. I don't know if that rule applies to anywhere else in the market, to be honest. At all. I think it was like TF2. I don't... Team Fortress 2 has always just been in the background doing its own thing. I feel like it's still huge, apparently. That I'm not surprised by. Player Unknowns was... Well, if you like Daisy, you're going to like Player Unknowns because it felt like Daisy. That's why I, a lot of people from Daisy like crossed over to it. It was Daisy a little bit more accessible. <laughs> Well, somehow managed just to tickle the pickle of the casual audience even more so. Uh, and this can happen on occasion with Call of Duty, for example, which I do believe was, uh, there you go, Call of Duty Modern Warfare there. Because Call of Duty was once actually the outlier. It was the competitor to Medal of Honor, which was the Nobody remembers Medal of Honor. To play a kind of thing, right? <laughs> and then Call of Duty came up from behind it, appealed better to the audience and to a wider, more casual audience as well. And now Medal of Honor, hell, most people probably don't even remember that it was a franchise. So it is possible, but it depends primarily upon your ability to debase yourself yet further.
as the wider market, as we often call it, right? Is it is real to a degree? I like to call it, you know, the illusion of the wider market or the mystical, mystical wider market, because for the majority of titles, it is a false mirage in the desert. To Total War, for example, the wider market is absolutely a big fat lie because you're a total war game. You will never be Fortnite. No matter how hard you try to appeal to the lowest common denominator, you will never ever reach them because they're going to look at you, a strategy game, huff, spit on you, and get back to playing Call of Duty. Total War is for crazy people. There's, there's, my, there's my hot take on that game. I don't understand Total War. As an old school FPS nerd, I'm the only one that remembers. Hey, I remember Medal of Honor. I remember specifically back when I was playing. <laughs> We're going to get into the weeds of games. I was a kid. I barely remember these games, by the way. Before anyone's like, old, I barely remember playing these games. When I was playing games like Metal Arms Glitch in the System, and boy, I'm going to awaken some memory in somebody really quickly. A good old game on PlayStation 2 called Alter Echo. <laughs> this shit's gonna make somebody's brain turn on. Hold on. Does anybody remember this? I won't be surprised if I get not a single yes. So Alter Echo was another older game. But I remember playing Alter Echo and the friend of mine who I borrowed this from actually very, very, almost as much as I do a tongue in cheek like, hey, you should play FF14 person who doesn't play FF14. As much as I do that, every time I would ask to borrow Alter Echo, he would be like, hey, you should try Medal of Honor. I think you'd like it. And I never liked Medal of Honor. I didn't like Call of Duty either back back then. I my tastes were not where they were. Very you if you're looking at this, and if you don't see why I was like into the design aesthetic as like as a Jack and Daxter fan. Hey. <laughs> I love the speed racer clips. Hi Luca, welcome in. Hope your week's been going well. We usually do FF14 content, but it's Friday, so we're just yapping it, and uh, we're going to play Jack and Daxter <laughs> when we get to it, but welcome in. Hi. But Medal of Honor didn't appeal to me, and it didn't until I think the reboot from DICE back in, I think, 2013... Because DICE rebooted Medal of Honor... Oh, 2010. And it sucks that it didn't sell well. Because... I'm gonna be honest. It was really good. Medal of, Medal of Honor 2010. Really, 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 really good. Like, if you want a good FPS story, that is... If you like... If you like war movies that try to take themselves seriously like the hurt locker or um crap what's the other one there's another really really good one uh sh shit i just watched it a few weeks ago whatever if you like the hurt locker if you like that style of cinematography if you like that style of like narrative progression go play 2010's medal of honor Story is really, really solid. The ending is very bittersweet and just like, well, this fucking sucks. There's also Medal of Honor Warfighter that is the follow-up to the reboot, the attempted sequel. Very, very different type of game. A little bit more Call of Duty skewed in terms of the set pieces, but it was good. It, it was also good. I liked it. I thought it was enjoyable. For these games, success is more easily achieved. All you really need to do is go for your core audience, which is what Nintendo proves again and again and again and again. Why do we have eight Mario Kart games? <laughs> 
Now, bear you in mind, I don't know much about Mario Kart, so perhaps I'm wildly mistaken here, but I do believe that the core gameplay loop of Mario Kart has remained largely unchanged. <laughs> yeah, you go around Baby Park forever and ever. When we get to it, it says sell one and a half hours industry. Oh my God, it's been an hour and 30 minutes already. <laughs> I thought it's been like 45 minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> maybe, you know what? We'll, maybe I should bring back the all day streams one day a week. I don't know. We'll have to think about that. If I can, if I can line up like two things to talk about that I can go on and on about, we can make it work. You can also watch come and see and get depression. I still need to watch that. I haven't seen that yet. I still need to check it out. Number one. <laughs> Why then are there eight of them? Why are we still making Zelda games? Because Zelda's cool. Super Mario Brothers games. Because you have a thing, it has an audience, and you simply keep feeding that audience what it wants year after year after year. That is how you build a franchise. Too many developers today are trying to become Fortnite, just overnight, just like that. Oh, hey, we're a normal success. You're not going to be. The odds of you being the next blow up success are about 0.0000000 ad infinitum 0.1%. Especially in a market already oversaturated with the next big things. Unless you actually do come up with a completely different next big thing, you're not going to be competing with the already entrenched opposition. I thought we would have learned this lesson by the World of Warcraft and the MMO boom, where 98% of those games failed miserably. What do you mean? Rift did really well. Rift did just fine. And so did Terra. And so did Firefall. They're all still okay. <laughs> They're still here. <laughs> Rift cope. <laughs> There's so many MMOs that came out that were really good. <sighs> Man, Rift was Rift was marketed well. It looked really cool. And from everything I understand about Rift, Rift's problem was the company that was above the developer. F just from my understanding, that company got ran into the ground. Well, the dev got ran into the ground by the publishing. I think it was the publishing company. Because Rift was cool, man. I didn't play it, but everything I saw about it looked so cool. And I didn't play it because I didn't have money. I was I was a poor child. <laughs> so my my MMO was RuneScape, and sometimes I had membership. But it is the video game industry, and its ability to absorb wisdom and or lessons is equal to that of a brain damaged goldfish submerged in a tank currently engulfed in electricity and or mustard gas. That mustard gas penetrate water. Mm. Anyways, you get the general drift. You need to create the audience. See, Total War didn't become big overnight either. It built an audience slowly but surely over time by perfecting the formula. Indeed, grand strategy in general is a fantastic... What's he talking about now? Uh, how the, the deep, deep backstory of Mario and the sad tragedy that occurred to Luigi in the first Paper Mario game actually has a lot to do with the parallels we could see in the gaming industry across the board of PC to Sony to Microsoft and to Nintendo. The example of what new developers need to be aiming for. You need to be aiming for the paradox model. Now, paradox has got to hell in a handbasket in and of itself, but the basic idea is still build an audience, build a niche, and then construct, 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 construct. And you are not even giving up the possibility of becoming a blow up success by doing so. Like, is Paradox the best comparison? I mean, I guess it is, but I feel like Paradox from ground, from ground, <laughs> from step one has been the most destructive and disgustingly exploitive game company I've ever seen. They, they, they're worse than EA, in my opinion, when it comes to the level of just d obvious content cut and in portion serving to maximize profit i feel like paradox is the worst dev house and 
publishing company in the industry. Maybe that's a super hot take. And if it is, I'm sorry, Paradox fans. You're fucking Stockholmed and insane. For people who don't know me, who's Paradox? Paradox is... Hold on. Let me let me find... Uh... It... So Paradox is a strategy game company. They made the games, I believe, Crusader Kings. They made Stellaris. And I don't think... They... Did they do Total War? I don't think they did Total War, did they? City Skylines. Hold on. Did they do Total War? There's no way. Oh my god, did they? No, they haven't. Okay, they didn't do Total War. So let me go to Steam really quick and I'll... I'll show you something and show anyone else who's curious about why I hate Paradox so much. If I go to Stellaris, okay, if we go to the Stellaris page and we're taking a look at like what's available, $40 game. It's what is called a, I believe an X3 game which is or 4x game my bad it is a 4x game what that means is when you start a, a match in a 4x game it doesn't end in like two three hours ten hours this match is gonna be session based it's gonna take weeks you're gonna spend multiple days probably playing this game and playing this match especially if they're really really good players you're going up against it is a it is a management game it's really fun I actually really like Stellaris. I I don't care for Civ. Stellaris was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun with Stellaris. It was really fun taking over the galactic map and just kind of working with friends to figure out trade agreements and whatnot to allow the game to continue. L really, really like Stellaris. Problem with Stellaris, though, $40 for the basic edition. Whatever. The problem is, I believe Stellaris has... It's if anyone plays Stellaris, please chime in here. It's like four races minimum locked behind a paywall from the jump. It, it like the first year it was out, they had I think it's like it was like a a, a new race and um Ow, what a, a secondary. Race. Why are they locked? <laughs> I'll free you. What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> but here's as I scroll down, here's the problem. You pay $40 for the base game and you are missing to me, a new player. It feels like almost half the content just outright is missing from the game. Just outright. You can buy it all for $290. But here, let's open up a few of these. Let's open the Utopia expansion, the Apocalypse, the Mega Corpse, the Federation, Nemesis, Overlord. Let's, let's see what these are. So Utopia is build a better space empire, blah, blah, blah. Utopia brings a host of changes, including mega structures, habitat stations, ascension perks, perks, indoctrination, advanced slavery, advanced governments. Stellar Stellaris Apocalypse brings uh but, but, there, that's no moon. Neither is that one. That one might be a moon. Wait, no, keep local systems in line with fear of new Colossus planet killer weapons. New enormous Titan capital ships. Watch out for Marauder Space Nomads uh, and yes. some nonviolent so features. Advanced farming. The, my problem with Stellaris, because I play MMOs, so I, I feel like the default point to respond to me on will be, well, is it this the same as an expansion in, in an MMO? The difference is when the expansion comes out a month and a half, two months, three months after release of the base game, and they didn't release anything little before that. And it just feels like content that was cut for no reason other than to milk more money out of people. That That's where it gets annoying. And Stellaris and all of their games are like this. Every game has an, a huge amount of content that's just chopped off, it feels like. Locked behind paywalls that you have to pay for. Instead of proper 
large content updates that are like, hey, this is an expansion. It's, hey, this is some content that we just shaved off. It's it's a, it's a one new race and like some extra ship features, maybe some extra trade features that you can do with people. Here, give us $30 for it though. Instead of, hey, expansion for 40 bucks, five new races, 18 new types of planets, six new types of ships, and 30 new features. It's chopped up instead into five expansions that are $20 a piece or $30 a piece. So it just feels greedy to me. I'm not a fan of Paradox. I never have been. I never will be. I think they're greedy. Crusader Kings 3, years after its release, became a blow-up success. Um, Helldivers 2, the perfect example. Nobody played Helldivers 1. Okay, that's a bit of an example. Mom, you hear what I your wallet looks heavy. Might if I carry it? No. I need my wallet to buy Mog Station items. I'm saying, right? And then Helldivers 2 arrived, and boom! Everywhere. It's one now one of the biggest games. And when this list comes out for, you know, 2024, etc., it's probably going to be on it. It's probably going to be competing with Fortnite, actually. You've got to construct franchises, video game developers. You cannot go for one and dump games anymore because the market of hits is probably dead and this does suck to a certain degree absolutely because what i'm essentially saying is you've got to make this is my franchise one two three four five six seven eight and that hardly encourages innovation in the gaming market and i wish it wasn't so i wish we could return to the days of you know company of heroes and dawn of war where games would release and they would at least have something special about them right so you company get nothing <laughs> you lose Good day, sir! Why is it so loud? <laughs> Game market. Dawn of War 2 and 1 with the killer, the sink kill animations. The sink kill animations weren't anything particularly, you know, revolutionary when you think about it. All it really is is that units look cool when they kill each other. But at least it was something, right? Especially compared to Dawn of War 3 or Company of Heroes. I don't, I don't know if I agree with the whole franchises are the new thing. The singular release hits are the thing of the past. Because it, it, if we go through, if we look at the PC market, how many of these are actually like franchises? So Fortnite is a one hit wonder. So we can knock that out. Roblox is propped up because of how many kids have access to it. Minecraft is similar, but Minecraft is also just a really, really solid game. And that's not to say Roblox isn't a solid game. Roblox is a game that is propped up by a market that it has access to, though. That, that The Sims doesn't have access to, and that like League doesn't have access to. I'm sure there's crossover between League and Roblox, but I don't think it's as big as people would think it is. Maybe I'm super wrong. Maybe I'm cr just crazily wrong and off base, but... Like, Valorant's new. It's its own thing. Rocket League is its own thing. League is its own thing. I, st I feel like there's a decent spread across all of these of games that are not part of franchises... And our single player, like single entry things or single entry things that blew up, except on PlayStation. PlayStation is like d very, very much skewed to, oh, it's, it's a, <laughs> it's a franchise game. Oh, it's the new one. So on, so on. The key really is to find one thing to innovate on, one thing to advance further, and then continue to building. Uh, Helldivers 2 could be used again as another excellent example of this. Helldivers 2 he doesn't reinvent the wheel in any real regards, it simply perfects the extraction shooter formula and adds in a couple of cool tidbits here and there, like for example the like mini rhythm game almost where you uh, use your arrow keys to call in call-ins, for example. Call in call-ins, well I suppose it's technically correct. That was a brilliant idea idea because it adds in a tremendous amount of stress to the act of calling an artillery barrage particularly if you're getting pelted by laser fire as you're doing it so please video game developers 
Stop trying to be Fortnite. You will never be Fortnite. Now, you could potentially eventually become a Fortnite-esque thing if you build on it. And this goes out specifically to Warner Brothers as well. The volatility of the franchise. The franchise is set in goddamn stone. <laughs> it is simply that you are trying to compete with stone on being hard. <laughs> And thus, unless you happen to be a diamond, you're probably going to lose out. Especially when you have a tremendous amount of potential IP power like Warner Brothers. What you need to try to do is be Mario Brothers rather than Fortnite. And this goes out to all of the smaller uh, developers as well. If you're making a game, make it for your audience first. Once you've constructed a base, then you can build on that base. And once you have a loyal fan base, they will almost never ever abandon you, even if you repeatedly and consistently abuse the shit out of them. <laughs> I don't know if Flynn is still here, but how's Destiny going? <laughs> I feel like that I feel like that's a destiny drive-by. Sonic in a nutshell? Yeah, Sonic 2. Sonic and Destiny. But it, 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 it... I Warner Brothers owns DC, right? Because they've had the same behavior with... With, um... Actually, let me see if they do own DC first. I want to make sure I'm not just, like, I'm going to put my foot in my mouth. Yeah, it is Warner Brothers. Okay. They do this with DC also. They saw the major success that Marvel was having. And they saw the major success that was coming from the first Hulk movie, followed by Iron Man, Iron Man 2, uh, forget whatever came out between 2 and 3. And eventually, Marvel branched that into the Avengers, because we got the Captain America movies, and we got the Thor movies, and we ended up at Avengers and it was super cool. It was really, really strong. There was a strong foundation. DC has tried twice now, three times almost to do a Justice League or DC hero crossover type movie like the Avengers without setting up any foundational just here's each character that you care about. Now here's all of them together. Other than, hey, it's Batman again. You like You guys like Batman, right? It's the eighth Batman movie. Eventually we got the Flash movies, but I I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how well those were received explicitly. All I know is I don't give a shit about the Flash. Which again, Total War has so neatly and thoroughly proved. <laughs> oh, God help me, Total War. It used to be a great franchise. Used to be. And though, even then, you can only beat a dog for so long until it's not biting you back, I suppose. As I've been playing the Lord of the Rings mod for Medieval 2 quite a lot recently, and whilst it is definitely designed for people who have played a lot more Medieval 2 recently than I have, and thus certainly has some mildly unfair elements to it, just the act of playing Medieval 2 again is incredibly zen. Like, the game just feels so much better. The pacing of it, the interface, all of it just... It's like coming home. It's a, it's a warm path after the trials and tribulations of modern-day Total War and Pharaoh. Do you guys get that with old games? Because I get it with Jack and Daxter. Like I, I get that with Jack. I get that with... If I go play the old Ratchet and Clank games, if I go play... I was about to say Demon Souls, but that one's explicitly a bias. That one's not fair. That's a bad comparison for me to say. Marvel allowed all characters to shine in the sequels. DC just made the other characters show up out of nowhere. That's what I mean. They didn't have a foundation. But it, 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 I can always go back to play Jack and Daxter. I can always go back to play Momodora Reverie Under the Moonlight. I can always go back to play Metal Gear Solid 4. I can always go black go go black. Go back to play 
uh, 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 like Mario Sunshine. If I'm tired of modern games, and it's not even that they're older and I've played more of them and I, I am nostalgic for them. Because I'm such a snob when it comes to input issues in games or behavior of mechanics. <laughs> Don't quote that. Um, it It's like... <laughs> I think it's more of a, a lot of modern games I... I, I don't know, I hit this weird resistance of lack of polish or lack of care on the initial release. Unless it's an indie game. In which case, it's like, I can go play Momo. I can go play Sidus 1 and 2 to name a rhythm game. That's, that's a genre people don't normally think about. But there's more modern rhythm games that I'm just not a fan of. I hate Thumper. I Everything I've seen of Beat Saber, I'd probably just not be super into it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm so picky with games that I don't think I could go play Dying Light Two or uh, Dead Island Two even the way I could go back and enjoy Dying Light One or Dead Rising Two, where on release the game felt whole and the mechanic aspects of it also felt complete and not just like a rushed out the door or half-hearted measure to tick a box of functionality that the game has in it or sent out with a, oh, we can patch it later and fix this part attitude. Mm -hmm. I guess even building the franchise can go wrong on occasion if you forgot if you forget about your actual audience. But still, that in my opinion is the takeaway of this. Don't try to be Fortnite. Try to be if anything medieval too. Yes. Or grand strategy in general. 9.6 years, eh? Honestly, I was hoping for it to be more on a PC. Do let me know what you think there in the comment section below as well as this is an interesting little topic but when it actually comes to like the the oldness of it that in and of itself is kind of a, a non non sequitur in my opinion because of course game design again to be played forever will be played forever not to mention when you are looking at top played games as well over a year unless you are looking at the flash in the pans the miracles like hell is 2 you're unlikely going to be uh, dethroning anything like fortnite it's frustrating because I, I, as much as I don't like the, the, and it is the reality of it, of game design to be played forever will be played forever. I'm, I get it. Like, I really, really, really get it. I still, I still go back and play RuneScape sometimes. I will play FF14 until the day it's, it's gone. I will, I might get into WoW at some point. I have an ESO key now. I We might check out ESO at some point, and we might do more MMOs on stream that weren't, you know, the expectation for me.